why can't we just do soups and shakes? It's worked. We've proved it. We've got amazing evidence. Why can't I just stick people on a soup and a shake diet for three months? The, the estimates currently are that some people can have type 2 diabetes for up to 10 years before they're even diagnosed. Can we achieve diabetes remission? The pros are that we can see what is working for the individual and we can have that personalised nutrition, which is great. Welcome to the Dietitian Bites podcast with me, your host, Reshma. I'm a registered dietitian and personal performance coach. I'm also the founder of The Dietitian in Harrods, a private practice providing nutrition and coaching services worldwide. I'm passionate about optimizing health and mindset for success. Each episode is packed with practical tips, expert insights, and a healthy dose of fun. Join me on this journey towards a healthier, happier life. I'm delighted to be talking to Will, who is the co-founder of We Nutrition, an expert dietitian specializing in pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, type 1, and gestational diabetes. He's also an expert in complex weight management. Will currently is a PCN dietitian in Northwest London supporting people with diabetes in 13 GP practices. Will would definitely be my go-to person if I needed support with a patient struggling with their diabetes or weight management. Diabetes is a complex condition and requires a team of experts to manage. Will, I welcome you to the Dietitian Bites podcast. Thank you so much, Reshma. What a lovely introduction. Thank you. So excited to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. So what led you to becoming an expert in diabetes? Um, I think... Oh gosh, this is casting my mind back now, but this diabetes has always been on my radar as a dietitian. I think it's, you know, it's, we see it so much in the NHS and in training. And what I found was when I was exposed to working with people with diabetes a little bit more was you really got to know people on a deep level. And that really resonated with me. And I just really enjoyed being able to work with people over a period of time and, you know, support them in achieving their goals and seeing the results when they came through. Um, just a really rewarding career. Wow. So you don't, you don't have diabetes yourself and that's not something that led you to no, becoming an expert. No, so not my family, not me. It's um, just professional is where it came from. <laughs> Ah, do you find that people always ask you what led you to becoming, I don't know, I always get what led mm. me to becoming a dietitian, um, but what led you to becoming uh, a specialist in a particular field? Absolutely. I think it's it's a bit of a curiosity. And I still, to this day, I will ask sort of the people that I consider my peers and the people that I look up to, my mentors, I'm still asking them those questions yeah. <laughs> because I want to know, you know, and I think it's, it's something about passion. You need to have a passion for what you do. Absolutely. You need to have that get out of bed and go. If that's not there for whatever reason, it's not really worth doing. It's quite unique to find that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So it, definitely a rewarding place to be, especially with how many people are getting diagnosed with diabetes. Mm. However, I think diabetes really is one of those silent diseases. Mm. It's so many people are walking around with it and they don't know um, how can we get people to be screened and to be more aware that actually even in your 30s, that's a time where you start thinking about your health and putting diabetes in particular on your radar? Absolutely. It's um, the, the estimates currently are that some people can have type 2 diabetes for up to 10 years before they're even diagnosed. So, you know, if we talk about the, the sort of the mean the three main symptoms of type 2 diabetes. We call them the three T's. Thirst, toilet, so going to the toilet and weeing yeah. a lot more, and tiredness. Yeah. Now, those three T's can be applied to a lot of different things. And sometimes we just sort of brush it off as, you know, moving into our 30s or moving into our 40s or, a, you know, promotion at work and we're working harder, the kids, you know. It's so easy to ignore those telltale signs. So I think awareness is so, so important for that if we do have those symptoms, yeah. we catch them really early because I think that's where the power comes in. Having awareness and catching type 2 diabetes early gives you more options. 
So at what age can we even go and think about getting a blood test? I mean, I would never get a blood test unless there was something indicating a blood test. I wouldn't just go to my GP and say, could I have a routine blood test? And I don't even think my GP would be too happy to see me for a routine blood test. Yeah, and we know how hard it is to get GP appointments as well. Um, I think, you know, if you are having symptoms that are out of the ordinary for you, mm -hmm. if you have that family history of type 2 diabetes, yeah. if there are other risk factors, um, so for example, um, ethnicity, or if we're carrying a little bit of extra weight, then these are the things that can predispose us, not always, but they can predispose us to type 2 diabetes. So it's definitely worth just getting a check. Now, after the age of 40, everyone in England, in the NHS, is entitled to a health check every five years. And that should be screening for diabetes, as well as other common diseases. Mm -hmm. So if you're not invited to that once you move into your 40s, claiming it is one of the most important things ever. <laughs> I don't think anyone would know that. I certainly don't know it. And that's working in the profession and having worked in the NHS. I've never thought at 40, I could go to my GP and say, I'd like a screen. Absolutely. You know, it, it sort of, it goes hand in hand with all those other screening processes that are available. So, you know, stool screening, um, uh, smears, breast screening, blood tests for um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, yep. it all goes hand in hand and we're entitled to it. But like you said, not many people know about it. It's yeah. there, it just needs claiming. <laughs> it's it's like um, gestational diabetes. We all have the glucose intolerance test when we're pregnant at a certain point. Mm. And I remember quite clearly, I remember when I was pregnant, going for this test and feeling really nervous. And my nerves came from, I was healthy, I felt fine, I was in good um, body weight. So I was like, oh, I don't have any indicators for this, mm. apart from the fact that I'm a brown girl and... It's more predominant in um, by ethnic, you know, in ethnic minorities. I was really nervous. Mm -hmm. Now, gestational diabetes. What's the link between gestational diabetes and type two? So once I gave, but I didn't have gestational diabetes, mm -hmm. and I know I've had friends that had gestational, but after giving birth, it completely disappears. Mm -hmm. Are they likely to get it again? So the the evidence is variable. The latest data. I think one of the statements that really stood out for me is the data is variable. And that has a lot to do with the way that we record data in the NHS um, and around the world as well. We know there's a disconnect between services. Data gets lost. It's not recorded properly. But the, the estimates are that around 50% of women with gestational diabetes yeah. will go on to develop type 2 diabetes within 5 to 10 years after having the baby. Now, I've seen estimates as low as 20%. I've seen estimates as high as 60%. So it's, you know, 50%. That's a scary number. But I do want to emphasize the fact that that is so, so variable mm -hmm. um, that we still don't really know a clear answer to that. We've got a bit of an idea. We've got an idea. And I feel like with the evidence that we do have, there is a strong indication that you will have you're predisposed already Absolutely. and you're more likely to get it mm. later in in life. Yeah. And I, I guess it kind of brings us back to the awareness that we were discussing. Yeah. You know, if we have that awareness and we can make changes where we can make changes, it gives us power yeah. to prevent. And that's that's a fantastic thing, I think, to to have. So for me, it's a massive thing, weight management post-pregnancy. Mm. Now, having been through that whole journey, I do remember myself thinking at eight weeks, when I went for my uh, like six week and eight week check, mm. I remember the uh, midwife looking at me and she's like, yeah, everything's great. Baby's fine. You're fine. Now, what method of contraception are you going to use? And I looked at her and I thought, eight weeks in, you are asking me, what method of contraception I'm going to be using. Surely the conversation should be around how are you feeling within yourself or, you know, emotionally, physically, because emotionally I thought I felt fine. Mm. I thought I felt fine. Mm. Physically within myself, I knew I was really struggling with my weight. Mm. And this is just eight weeks after having a baby. Mm. I remember thinking, 
when is this weight going to fall off? And I need to lose the weight. And no one's telling me, oh, it's safe to do so or it's okay. And my desire to lose weight wasn't from a health perspective. Mm. It was actually from an aesthetic perspective. I wanted to get back into work. Mm. I'm a specialist in weight management and I did not want to go back to work looking like I've just had a baby. Mm. So I was shocked that nobody had the conversation with me at any point, mm. which is why I'm so particular about having the conversation with mothers when they're pregnant, mm. that post-pregnancy at some point, we are going to discuss how we get you back in shape, not mm. just physically, but even mentally. Mm. But the physical bit is important because what I find in clinic is women talk to me about weight and they're like, oh, it all happened after I had a baby. Mm. And when I'm like, okay, so how old are your children? And they tell me they're like 20 years old. I'm like, mm. oh, that happened a long time ago. Mm. I think it's important that we encourage women mm. to get back feeling physically and mentally fit. And that is also looking at BMIs, looking at their weight and saying, pre-pregnancy, this is where you were. We would like to get you closer to your pre-pregnancy weight because, you know, you feel good. Mm. You feel like you've got yourself back, but also you've just reduced your risk mm -hmm. of all the, you know, post-pregnancy complications mm. you could have and things like diabetes. Mm. I don't think it's a conversation anyone's having at the moment. I I mean, put it out there. I will I will never appreciate this on such a level. I'm a cis white man. <laughs> I'm not even going to pretend to know what I'm talking about or what people are experiencing here. But I think it, like I I I agree that we need to be having these conversations and having them earlier yeah. is always better. You know it. it in pregnancy, outside of pregnancy, any time of life. And it needs to be personalized as well. You know, I think so many of us put other people first and we forget to look after ourselves and we forget to have that compassion that we use with other people. We don't always use it with ourselves. And I think especially yeah. when the body does such a fantastic and tremendous thing, such as pregnancy, that compassion, that self-care is so important um yeah. so you know even if we would just have that conversation of how are you looking after yourself how are you putting you first when you've just given your body over yeah. to to a wonderful thing where do you come into this I think the conversation needs to be had earlier on. So actually, when you fall pregnant, knowing that your post-pregnancy package has an element of weight management in it, has an element of mental health in it. So women are aware that they're going to be supported post-pregnancy. And actually, we're doing it from a clinical place. You know, we're not just here to aesthetically get you back into work, which is just what I needed. But we're here to make sure that we've reduced your risk of getting anything later in life by just having the conversation and encouraging you to start thinking about it when you're ready. I mean, for some some women, eight weeks is too soon to think about anything. Mm -hmm. For others, eight weeks is like, right, I'm ready to go back to work. And it's only here in the UK where you get your nine months, mm -hmm. you know, maternity. If you look at other countries, they're getting a couple of months and they're going straight back into work. Yeah, that's intense. Yeah. Oof. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. Like, Let's have the conversations. It's so yes, important. <laughs> definitely. So, Will, what's the most challenging population group you work with? Ooh, um, my, my, my. I think every group, every population has their own challenges. I mean, that's probably why I love doing what I do, because I love a challenge. Mm -hmm. I love problem solving, solution finding. Um, I tell you what, I used to work with teenagers okay. with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's such a unique stage of life. And I remember going to a conference and they were talking about our, how our brain develops. And they were saying that they did scans and they, they found out that our brains don't fully develop until we're about 25 years old. Mm. So biologically, physiologically, we are still changing up until the age of 25 years old. Now, what that what that realization was for me was that, okay, well, I'm working for, I'm working with 11 to 25 year olds. Yeah. And, you know, if you've got a, a 16, a 17, an 18 year old or a young adult in front of you, they exhibit a lot of typical adult behaviors. Um, they look like an adult, but there are just some things that go a bit off 
or you know there's there's behaviors that you just wouldn't really expect and that was a light bulb moment for me to say you've got an adult looking person in front of you but they think very differently to you yeah. um and you know it's it's not really in a classical medical neurodivergent way it's just being a teenager, teenager. and a young adult yeah and that for me was i was like oh okay okay and it got me working differently with that population as mm -hmm. well um but i think we've all experienced those those teenage moments where <laughs> we present our challenges so i found that um the university age was usually the most challenging mm -hmm. time for me to work with type 1 diabetics and I think that boils down to the level of alcohol that they're drinking. So mm. they're going out, all of a sudden you have that freedom, mm. but you don't really know how to manage your diabetes and your hypo situation. And, and also you don't want to make people aware that you're a type one at that point. Um, you know, people are still just trying to form new friendships. And I guess that's not the first thing you're going to say to somebody. Oh, by the way, I'm a type one. So just look out for me on a night out. I used to find that really challenging. I think as I started doing diabetes more and more, I realized I actually found my own population, like the South Asian population, really difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons um, it's so challenging is because they're not taught about diabetes. Now, I don't think anyone is, mm -hmm. but they really don't know about the disease, the silence of it. Mm -hmm. And when you feel the symptoms, mm. it's quite frankly too late to make significant changes to reverse that. So I found the education part really difficult. How do you educate someone on what's going on mm. and translating that science in a different language and making them understand it? And we had some fantastic tools uh, just as I graduated, like conversation map training, mm -hmm. which I used in different languages. Mm -hmm. It made it really simple, but I think we've gone away from there again. We've gone back to complicated dietetics and complicated ways of explaining yeah. things. We just need easy YouTube videos. I remember a really good one about lock and key yeah. and showing how the cells work. Yeah. And now I direct all South Asians to really useful resources, mm -hmm. but also using dietitians that can speak different languages to help them to understand. But for me to this day, it's a barrier. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, I think what we're speaking to or what you, you, you're describing there really speaks to the, you know, we're talking about challenges with populations, but I think a more general challenge would be the stigma around diabetes as well. And the fact yeah. that those conversations aren't happening. And maybe we see that more in um, certain communities. Absolutely. And that's what because those conversations aren't happening, people aren't asking those questions, the education isn't made. Um, and it just, it's a bit of a vicious circle, isn't it? Because how do we have those conversations without those simple messages being there to explain what's going on for something that can be quite complex? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It is definitely challenging. I feel like we've got some fantastic experts that can actually just translate this mm. into different languages and different ways of explaining mm. it to people so they understand the difference between type one, type two, and all the rest. Mm. Now, you said something interesting uh, in a previous conversation that we had, and that was around type two diabetes and the age you can get it. Mm. Now, I never thought children could walk around with type two diabetes mm -hmm. and Never would I think, let me screen my children mm -hmm. at 10 or 11 if they had a higher BMI or, you know, we have at 10 and 11 now, mm -hmm. all schools um, do BMIs for children and mm -hmm. their parents get letters to mm -hmm. let us know what our heights and weights are. And then we get a little statement at the bottom saying they're in the healthy range or they're not in the healthy range. Mm -hmm. Type 2 diabetes in a 12 year old. Tell me about that. Unfortunately, it is happening more. We're seeing it more. It's increasing. Um, we know that, you know, in, in adults, well, we know as a population, in a, in a Western population, we're sort of seeing a rise in BMI. Um, we see that diabetes kind of follows that trend. So type 2 diabetes follows the trend of a higher BMI. Yep. So as a population, as our BMIs increase, the prevalence or the amount of type 2 diabetes increases. And we know that's happening in children as well. Um, so yes, I've worked with 11 year olds, 12 year olds with type two diabetes, strong family histories. Yep. Um, not always carrying extra weight. 
mm-hmm. um, but it, it can be there. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to scare anyone by saying, you know, if the child, if your child is overweight, they're at risk of type two diabetes. Yes, it might be something that we see in future, but I think looking out for those, th- the three T's that I was talking about earlier, yes. you know, parents know their child instinctively. If there is something up, you pick it up <laughs> straight away, be- probably before they even do. Um, and you'd get them to the GP, you know. So I think, and also I think weight management in children, there's so there's so much we still have to learn about it. Yeah. Because we know that weight fluctuates in children. We know that, you know, weight will increase and, and feet will grow just before a growth spurt. Yes. And that is normal and that is natural. And yeah. we we don't need to be medicalizing that. Um, we just need to be having a healthy approach um, because there's a huge psychological component yeah. to weight management, to, to diabetes. We need to be able to support people, especially children, in the right way mm-hmm. around that. Absolutely. I just had this thought when you uh, said we know our children really well. And I remember my son at one point, mm-hmm. he was um, going to the loo up to 10, 15 times in the hour. And all I could think of is, oh, I've created a type one. I've definitely created a type one. And I remember going to the GP, I phoned, I booked an appointment and they're like, so what's the issue? I was like, I'm pretty sure my son has type one diabetes. I'd just like you to do the test. And I got in there the GP looked at me, he goes, that's a bit extreme, Reshma. I was like, sorry, I'm a dietitian. My mind straight away goes to the most extreme and I would like you to rule it out. And he's like, as a GP would check the child's bladder and usually the diagnosis is they've just got a small bladder or they don't know how to hold their urine in. Mm -hmm. And here you are sitting here like, no, it's a type one diabetic. Could you just help us out please (laughs) and get me the right referral? And in my mind, I do remember thinking, this would be the time to phone Will and be like, guess what I created? (laughs) But no, luckily it was, it wasn't even a small bladder. He just really enjoyed going to the loo, so. (laughs) Fair enough. I f- uh, these are the challenges that we face, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, parenting comes with many weird and wonderful things. <laughs> now, I would like to talk to you about something very controversial. Oh, okay. Tell me about the new injections and uh, how we're going to revolutionise weight loss. Okay. So, yes, this is hot topic of the moment. It really um, is. And I absolutely love it. I, I think it's always good to have options. You know, if I ever have a health condition... I want a menu of options. I want a smorgasbord of options. And I think that's what we're seeing now with weight management and medication. So the latest weight loss injection to to sort of come to the UK, it's something called Wigovi. Yes. And it's um, it's a medication that's been used in diabetes for years. I want to say 10, 15 years. And was that uh, branded as Empic? Yes. Okay. So it's um, it's semaglutide is the drug, mm-hmm. and when we use it with type two diabetes, it's Zempic. Yep. When we use it without type two diabetes for weight management, it's Wigovi. Okay. Um, and yes, there's a lot of hype about this recently, um, and getting some really good results as well. So I'm I worry about this, and mm. I worry because private practice. I know that my clients will have access to this drug. Mm-hmm. Um, although it says you need to have a BMI of 30 to get prescribed it, I think, you know, people can get anything anywhere if they put their money down. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not an expensive drug mm-hmm. uh, from my population's point of view. It's actually very reasonable and accessible. Mm-hmm. Now, my fear is what happens to clients or patients that take Wagovi? and are of a low BMI. So I'm talking between 25, around 25, so 20 Mm. to 25 BMIs. Mm -hmm. And they have access to this Mm. and it technically works as an appetite suppressant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see nutritional deficiencies because they're hardly eating anyway and then they're suppressing their appetite. So they're definitely going to get weight loss, Mm. but from a nutrition point of view, for me, they're going to become deficient. The current guidelines for using Wigovi are with a BMI over 35 Mm -hmm. with one comorbidity, which is associated with uh, holding extra weight. So that might be um, sleep apnea or it could be high blood pressure or high cholesterol or a BMI above 30 
um, with with a reason that you would be referred to a specialist weight management team okay. in a hospital. So, for example, that might be someone with learning difficulties that needs that extra attention. Mm-hmm. Now, those BMI points, I know there's the conversation around BMIs for another day. There are problems there, but yeah. it's there. Um, those BMI points are lowered for um, sort of black minority ethnic communities. So we yes. lower it by 25 So those are the current NICE guidelines based on the research that has been done. When we start using medications outside of the guidelines, we go into the unknown. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, there hasn't been proper research done. And that increased the risk of using that medication in those areas because we don't know what's going to happen. Now, we could almost say that it's bordering on abuse of the medications as well, you know like we've seen for decades, abuse of laxatives. Yes. But yeah. you can go into any shop and you can buy laxatives and you can go online and you can buy this injection. Yeah. Is it the right thing? Ooh. You know, from a safety point of view, no, I get worried. I share those concerns. I share the concerns about people just feeling rubbish. You know, yeah. if the you're... Side effects. Yeah, if you're going around and... This has this medication has side effects and they are yeah. not nice. And if you're not nourishing yourself physically, biologically, mentally, mm-hmm. that is going to show in some way or other. What if we just gave them a multivitamin with it? Absolutely. As, as an absolute minimum, absolutely. But I think sometimes, you know, if people aren't, if we're, if we're looking at malnourishment, essentially, mm-hmm. you know, a multivitamin isn't going to cut it. Um, the guidelines say that use this medication with a specialist weight management team. Yeah. So, you know, if anyone is taking this injection, I want a multivitamin there. I want a dietitian. I want some type of psychology support. Absolutely. I want a, a doctor or a GP having oversight. Um, it's It really is the team. When it comes to weight management, we know how to lose weight. Yeah. We've got loads of evidence and loads of methods for weight loss. Weight maintenance is a different bag. And I the research tells us we haven't quite cracked that yet. Yeah. We still need to understand that more. So it's exciting. But I think it is a bit of a double-edged sword as well with this. It's definitely very exciting. I feel like it's the it's the thing that we need before bariatric surgery. I feel like there's a big jump from a tier three weight management service mm. to straight, we go to bariatric sur- mm. surgery. Even if someone's in the service for one or two years, mm. I still feel like we needed something in between. So an injection is fantastic. Mm. Uh, you can administer it at home. I think it's quite cost effective. You know, it's not it's, it's going to be a lot more pleasant mm. than bariatric surgery. However, you can be on this for two years. Mm. And I don't think from experience mm. that even two years is long enough for actual behavior change. Mm-hmm. So we see that clients that do bariatric surgery, they're very successful for the first two years. Mm-hmm. They've lost a phenomenal amount of weight. Mm-hmm. But then there's a rapid regain. And that's mm-hmm. because people can cheat any system. You can cheat surgery. Mm-hmm. I had tier three, I had clients in my tier three service Mm. that had the surgery and are coming back because they're regaining the weight. So are we finding a short term fix with our injections? The optimist in me wants to say, no, this is going to be long term. The realist in me says, I think this is a bit of a short term fix. But, you know, do we maybe as as sort of the way that we approach weight management, you know, do we realign our expectations to sort of say, okay, well, losing weight for two years or three years yeah. has greater outcomes versus not losing any weight or even gaining more weight? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sort of talking about a higher BMI population. Because, you know, is it just human nature that we always want to return to our habits? Yes. We know behavior change is hard. Weight management is hard. Extremely hard. Yeah. And maybe we just need to recognize that these patches of sort of lower weight are beneficial in mm-hmm. the bigger picture that, you know, they're reducing our risks in the bigger picture. And it might be that works for us for some time. 
and then we move on to something else. Or we revisit that may revisit something that maybe didn't work earlier and give that another go because mm -hmm. we're always changing, we're always evolving. Yes. How I was five years ago is not how I am now. And what worked for me five yeah. years ago wouldn't work now. But it might work in five years. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's weight management for you. Yeah. It's, you know, my clients will do the same thing, everything they've been told to do. And all of a sudden you get that phone call, I'm doing it and I'm doing it really well and I'm not losing any weight. And I'm like, well, your body does become used to what it's doing. You do have to change up the game. So injections, they definitely have a place. Mm -hmm. There is a huge safety element to them, I think. Uh, I don't think anyone taking an injection uh, should be allowed to do so mm. without the support of a dietitian yes. or a psychologist or a doctor that's actually going to check up on their side effects and mm. their vitamin and mineral status and actually what they're eating and how diverse it is and gut health and all the rest. Mm. So if we take it a step back, okay. why can't we just do soups and shakes? It's worked. We've proved <laughs> it. We've got amazing evidence. Why can't I just stick people on a soup and a shake diet for three months? Will it works? Wow. Yes, it works. It works. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, there is amazing evidence around this. If we if we go to the research and we think about the direct trial, if yes. we think about the droplet trial, if we think about the retune trial, beautiful pieces of research that showed yeah. us that in people with type 2 diabetes and outside of type 2 diabetes, having a low calorie diet, 800 calories a day, yep. made up of special medical formula soups and shakes mm -hmm. helps people to lose significant amounts of weight and in type 2 diabetes can really help with remission of yes. type 2 diabetes as well this is you know this this research that's coming out is so exciting again it goes to those options let's have the options and mm -hmm. let's let people choose um i've tried the soups and shakes um diet have you tried it no oh it is it is tricky. So I have read all the research on it. I have also um, gone through some of uh, the testimonials that people have uh, provided when doing it. And I know it's difficult. It has to be because you're taking away all the pleasure element of food. And, you know, for majority of the people, they eat for pleasure. No one just eats for nutrition. I don't Absolutely. think nutrition is the number one reason why people eat. Absolutely. It really is that pleasure, that connection. Um, I, I fall into that 1% that does not eat for pleasure, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's just nutrition. You can put anything there. If it's in the right components, I'm like, yeah, that's a, that's a good meal. <laughs> we can do this. I am really keen to promote this, this way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Because for me, diabetes remission is so important. Mm. Can we achieve diabetes remission? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's something that I think we really need to be promoting at diagnosis. We need to be saying that this should be the main option, or it needs to be up there in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Now, with um, the main message at diagnosis and with remission is the more weight that we're able to lose, the greater our chances of achieving remission. Remission being healthy blood glucose levels without diabetes medication for three months. Mm -hmm. There are loads of other questions being thrown up. So for example, that we still don't know and we're finding out. So for example, how long does remission last? What mm -hmm. can we do to make remission last longer? Um, you know, who is more likely to achieve remission before they started remission? Um, but yeah, at, at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, or even at pre-diabetes, we could be saying, look, this is an option. Do you want to do a soup and shake diet mm -hmm. and, and look at achieving remission? Um, and again, the, the, the key thing with this, you know, with all these tools, with the injections, the bariatric surgery, the, the different diets, it's support of a specialist team. Yes. It's yeah. so key. So key. Is remission possible for someone that's been on diabetes medication, so not necessarily insulin, but just medication for five years? Yes, absolutely. So the current research says people with diabetes for less than six years okay, um, and uh, with a higher BMI, but we're also seeing it in lower BMIs. Now we've got the retune trial that came out. Okay, that was so great. tell me about that. 
if I was diagnosed with diabetes, mm. say today, mm -hmm. I'm a healthy BMI, I'm working out, I'm living a good life, mm -hmm. there is, there's not much I can change. How are you going to help me to get into remission? So let me, let me talk about the Retune trial, because yes. this is fantastic. Now, it was a small trial. I think there are about 20 people in it. Um, and, you know, there's, we, I haven't seen any of the data around the, 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 the cohort that was used. Um, so, but what we did see was that the average BMI was 24. Okay. And what they did was a soups and shakes diet for about two to four weeks. Mm -hmm. And then they reintroduced food slowly. I think it was about over six to eight weeks. Uh, might've been a little bit less than that. But then this cycle they repeated for up to three times until a person lost 10 to 15% of their original body weight. Okay. Now, the average BMI at the start was 24. Yep. The average BMI at the end of the cohort was 22. Wow. So we're, okay. we're working in those lower BMIs, yep. the healthy BMIs. Yep. And the message that was coming from this, which is kind of... Um, a repeat, it's an echo of what we saw in direct, is that it doesn't matter about the BMI on the outside or the, the excess fat that we carry on the outside. It's about the adipose tissue, the fat yes. on the inside around mm -hmm. our liver and pancreas. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. And in these trials, they did scans and they looked at that and they were seeing that the fat around those vital organs reduced yeah. and the hypothesis is that that is what's getting us the remission that is amazing so yes even at healthy bmis with diagnosis of type 2 diabetes remission is possible with weight loss but then there's also research that tells us that low carb diets mm -hmm. without weight loss can help remission as well you know, this blows my mind usually because it's so hard to tell a healthy individual this mm. and just explaining to them that you can be healthy, you can look healthy on the outside, mm. but what we're here to do is figure out what's happening on the inside. And that is that to me is simply diabetes. So running a private clinic in somewhere like Harrods, I don't see people with very large BMIs. And when I do diabetes management there, it's mm -hmm. actually in the healthier population. So mm -hmm. I am looking at people that are eating well, working out well, and then getting diagnosed or having slightly mm -hmm. high blood sugars mm -hmm. for a few months. And they're like, what am I doing wrong? And I'm like, actually, we need to take this internally and mm -hmm. work from the inside out because yeah. from the outside, you're doing it and it's working and yeah. it's good but your blood tests are showing you something different. And that's not an external thing. That really is an internal thing that we're looking at. Absolutely. And it's, you know, I think it's, we need to celebrate the benefits that we're having when people are engaging in all those behaviors yeah. and getting so many results, but still being diagnosed with diabetes. Yeah. But, you know, if you weren't doing all that, the diabetes might have come sooner. Absolutely. And it, yes. you know, it might be harder to manage as well. So actually, all those behaviours that you've done already are really, really beneficial. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's why we're here as specialists to guide, support, do those little tweaks that we know the evidence tells us that works. Mm -hmm. Yes, I completely agree. So back to diets. Yes. Why can't we just do keto, Will? Why can't <laughs> type one put them on keto? Doesn't that isn't that the answer? Ooh, I, oh, I I look. I wish it were that simple. I really do. I mean, keto I mean, I keto has its place, definitely. Well, it never had its place in diabetes. This diet was produced for management of epilepsy in children. Mm. I can't even imagine how. I mean, I can. I know exactly how a diet gets anywhere. Mm. You know, these are the trends, but it makes sense. Absolutely. Um, so let's let's start off with type 1 diabetes. Yeah. So the current guidelines for type 1 diabetes are not to use the keto diet. Okay. So a keto diet being less than 50 grams of carbs per day. Mm -hmm. and, and what 50 grams, just for our listeners, what mm, is 50 grams of carbs? <laughs> it's a it's a couple of large bananas. Yeah. It's um it's maybe two thick slices of bread, and that can be uh, wholemeal, white bread, whole grain bread. Yeah. Um, so that's it. It's like one carb serving in the day. It's literally. nothing. It's nothing for carbs. Okay. Um, 
The reason why we don't encourage it with type 1 diabetes is because, as the name suggests, the keto diet produces something called ketones, yep. which are a chemical in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And they're a byproduct of when we break down fat as energy. Yep. Now, normally, we, we our bodies would use carbs as energy. Yep. When we restrict carbs, our bodies switch to fat. They produce ketones. And in a healthy adult, we can manage ketones. But in type 1 diabetes and potentially in type 2 diabetes using insulin, mm -hmm. our bodies aren't able to regulate ketones as well. Mm -hmm. And that means that the ketones can increase and increase and increase. And if they get to a certain point, they make our bodies acidotic. Yeah. So they disturb the pH balance. And that is just not good news. So we want to try and avoid that as much as possible. I've, I've had some people with type 1 diabetes who have been fine in the morning but by lunchtime, their ketones are so high for a number of reasons. And we're talking intensive care there, especially with children with type 1 diabetes. Yeah. We know that it can stunt, keto diets can stunt growth. So we, we don't want to be using keto in children with type 1 diabetes either. So I know the evidence is now weighing highly, especially in type 2. Mm. And if you have a healthy BMI that a high protein diet and a lower carbohydrate diet is the way forward. Mm -hmm. So can't type twos do keto? Yeah, absolutely. That is an option on the menu for type two diabetes and pre-diabetes. Um, it's, I think if someone likes that style and they can build it into their life and they can maintain it, it's sustainable, then definitely let's give it a go. Let's make sure we're doing it in a healthy way. Yeah. Um, but absolutely. So healthy way, I would assume, means don't just go and buy all the keto products on the market and start changing everything. Absolutely. I think it's worthwhile chatting to someone who can guide you through, can support you through. Yeah. Um, making sure that you're still having a really healthy, balanced diet for gut health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you are get some carbs in there, make sure they're whole grains. Get your fruits and vegetables in there. Um you know, when we start restricting any part of our diet, we need to do it in a really safe way yeah. and sustainable way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, definitely do your homework, get some support. Now, the way Wagovi excites me, I could not let you leave without talking about continuous glucose monitors, because I'm pretty sure in my clinic that will be the next thing that comes up was, can you put a monitor on me just so we can see what's happening? Yeah. What is your take on um, CGM monitoring? I share your excitement. I, I think it's so good. And this this technology is progressing rapidly. Um, you know, we didn't have this sort of what six years ago seven years yep. ago now we're on the third generation of wearable um commercially available monitors yep. that monitor or give ideas about our blood glucose levels and the trends now again it's another tool mm -hmm. it has pros and cons the pros are that we can see what is working for the individual and we can have that personalized nutrition which is great the cons sometimes it's a bit data overload mm -hmm. and it can be really hard to understand what is actually going on and through that we can we can almost have a bit of a fear and i've seen this happen i've seen people get sensors pop them on and then start restricting foods yeah. and eliminating food groups mm -hmm. which is where my worry comes in Mine too. So I would definitely like to have a monitor. Uh, but I know, based on my personality, that I would stop eating certain foods when I know deep down inside they're not actually harmful. Mm -hmm. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But that would scare me. Mm -hmm. And that's a health professional with all the new, you know knowledge of berries are going to make your blood sugars go up and so are bananas. Mm -hmm. And it's normal for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And for some groups... It's life-saving for mm -hmm. it to happen. You know, they need their blood sugar levels to go up. And you mentioned the word personalized nutrition because mm -hmm. that's what's going to sell it. Mm -hmm. We're going to tell people we are personalizing your nutrition mm -hmm. with a monitor that's not actually doing much personalization. Mm -hmm. And my fear is that people will remove foods. Mm -hmm. Do we all react the same way? Would you and I react 
the, would we have a similar response in blood sugar levels if we ate berries? So assuming we're both sat here, healthy adults, yep. then yes, generally speaking, yes, we would have the same reaction to foods. Um, so our blood glucose levels would have the same reactions to foods. Mm -hmm. um, however, we could both do the same thing today, tomorrow, the day after, and we'd still get slightly different responses mm -hmm. because there are so many things that impact our blood glucose levels. It's not just food, it's activity. It's the fact that, you know, I might have done a little bit of cleaning or I walked a little bit more today or I did some exercise yesterday or I did a commute and I was stressed yep. or I didn't sleep well last night. There are so many sort of subtle factors that impact that there's always going to be variation. But generally speaking, yes, we would have the same outcome. Okay. So I think we need to be a bit cautious about blood glucose monitoring in the healthy population mm -hmm. because... We can predict what it's going to show you. If mm -hmm. you had a donor, I can tell you exactly what your blood sugars are going to do. Yeah. And I don't know if something like this will lead to positive behavior change. Mm -hmm. I think it might lead to behavior change in a negative way if we're not careful, where people will be like, oh, I'm not allowed to eat the good. Mm -hmm. it, it, if it changes you not eating donuts all day, fair enough. But if it's going to take away some of the healthy vitamins and minerals from fruit, mm -hmm. because it's going to give you a very similar response to what a donut may do. Yeah it's actually going to be uh, negatively impacting. Absolutely. Personalized I, nutrition. Absolutely. I've, I've, I've got a few clients who sort of say to me, you know, my blood glucose levels are going up and going down and I want to try and get them flat. And I always say, they're supposed to go up. They're supposed to go down. Yes. They're not supposed to be flat. If they're flat, we're worried. Yeah. If they go up and they stay up, we're worried. Yeah. But they are su definitely supposed to go supposed up and down. down. <laughs> great, great. Well, Will, I could speak to you forever when it comes to diabetes. Only I'm so passionate and you have the knowledge. <laughs> so I would want to chew your brains on this again. However, we're going to draw to a close. Mm -hmm. And before we do, I would love to give you the opportunity to ask me a question so our listeners get to know a bit about me as well. Oh, um, I would love to know what's the favourite part of what you do? The favourite part? I think... Having a business now and running my own business, one of the most um, exciting things is uh, not having to get my annual leave signed off. And I know that's very personal. This has nothing to do with clients. It's actually do with, to do with my own life. Mm. But having the time to actually think about the directions you want your business to go in, what kind of clients you want to work with, and being able to select your cohort of clients. It's not like an NHS clinic where you get your 12 patient cl client cl patient mm -hmm. list and yeah. you're like, okay, w whether I want to see them or not, they're booked into clinic today. Yeah. I know exactly who I'm booking in, who I'm going to see, their journeys on a personal level. And for me, that just freedom of time and to pick who you're going to work with and almost plan out what their journey is going to look like sometimes over a year mm. so I've got clients that sign up for a year mm. quite possibly is the most exciting and rewarding thing I've ever done in my career that sounds fantastic very envious <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for taking the time uh, to share everything you know about diabetes and you know having some intense conversations about injections and soups and shakes which is the way forward for me but also about continuous glucose monitoring which is the new personalized nutrition we have i can't thank you enough for your time thank you so much for having me it's been an absolute treat and i would do it again anytime <laughs> thank you well wow.